So we're going to move on to item 2.1, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Uh, Trustee Murphy, seconded by Trustee Carabella. Um, all in favor? Okay. The agenda is approved. Moving on to item 2.2, the approval of the minutes from the June 11, 2019 meeting. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, Trustee DeRosa, seconded by Trustee Duarte. All in favor? Okay. The, uh, the approval, the minutes have approved. Item number three, declarations of conflict of interest. There are none. Moving on to item number 4.1, policy I-19, occupational health and safety. So do I have a motion to get this onto the table? Trustee O'Brien, seconder. Trustee Murphy. And we have, um, uh, we have Superintendent O'Hare to give us some more information. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. Uh, this is one of those uh, policies that uh, need to be reviewed on an annual basis uh, under the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act, there is a requirement for boards to review their occupational health and safety policy on an annual basis. Uh, staff has done that and has uh, recommended some minor changes. Uh, the changes are really um, adding in some associated policies and procedures and also clarifying on the second page policies, procedures, and practices. Uh, so we ask that you adopt uh, the policy with the revisions and um, it will then be posted throughout uh, the board in each workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Trustee O'Brien. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, the purpose in the policy states the Holland Catholic District School Board is dedicated to providing a safe working environment. That's right under the purpose. Um, since it is an occupational health and safety policy, could we put the phrase um, and healthy before the word working so that it reads, the Halton Catholic District School Board is dedicated to providing a safe and healthy working environment. Uh, that way the purpose is in line with the rest of the policy, which does speak quite well to health concerns. Is there any other comments or, or Superintendent O'Hare, do you have any comments? Uh, I, I, I'm just a little concerned around what people may perceive healthy to mean. Um, again, the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, has uh, a number of definitions and um, I, I, would, I would ask that we be able to uh, kind of review that request um, as opposed to adopt that. So um, I'd be happy to go and, and spend a little bit of time with that suggestion, but I, I would like to go and have some conversations probably with legal counsel on it. Thank you. So if that being the case, I'm oh sorry, thank you to Madam Chair. Are there definitions around the word safe as well that um, you do feel comfortable with? Yes, I do. Uh, it, it, it's healthy from a broader interpretation. Um, you know, the, the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, is defined um, I'm a little concerned that people may stretch healthy to mean more than simply uh, what's intended under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. If I may, uh, my understanding is as well, uh, Superintendent O'Hare, is under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, it actually makes reference that the employer is required to provide a safe working environment. So those, those words actually come directly out of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Does that, does that help, Trustee O'Brien? Is there any other discussion? Oh, sorry. So uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act talks about health from an organizational perspective in terms of making sure that boards are putting in um, you know, uh, safety mechanisms to ensure that there isn't occupational uh, risks. Um, 
and, and again, so, so I don't want to mislead you to go and say that health isn't part of it. Um, it it's really kind of semantics versus health versus healthy. Um, so that's, that's where I'm a little hesitant. Thank you. Trustee O'Brien, does that, does that satisfy you or are you interested in pursuing this? Thank you, that does satisfy me. Is there any other discussion on this item? Uh, do we want to take a vote? Okay. We'll start with you, Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Trustee Antomasi. In favor. Do you want to read the recommendation? Or? Sure, I can read, read the recommendation. <laughs> So that the policy committee recommends that policy I-19 occupational health and safety be forwarded along with amendments to the September 17, 2019 regular board meeting for approval. We've already had a motion and a seconder, so we'll go to recorded vote. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Trustee Antomasi. In favor. Trustee Carabella. In favor. Trustee Murphy. In favor. Trustee DeRosa. In favor. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustee O'Hearn Chernot. Um, policy passes. Moving on to item 4.1. This is policy III-11, item 4.2 on our agenda. And can I get a motion that the policy committee recommends that policy III-11, hiring, promotion, policy, academic, and non-academic personnel be forwarded to the September 17, 2019 regular board meeting for approval. Trustee Duarte, seconded by Trustee O'Brien. Uh, uh, Superintendent O'Hare, do you want to? Thank you. Through you, um, th this particular policy deals with uh, the promotion policy for academic and non-academic personnel, and it was last reviewed in 2012. Um, it certainly provides for equal opportunity for all employees and applicants for employment, and it's consistent with our obligations uh, under the Human Rights Code. Uh, we also in the policy do highlight the rights of Catholic school boards in Ontario with respect to the Human Rights Code, the Constitution Act of uh, 1982, and uh, the Education Act. There are minor um, changes to the policy. Uh, we have gone and added in uh, a couple of associated policies and procedures for reference. We've eliminated the word manual under purpose because we have HR procedures. It's not really a manual. We have referenced the, uh, again, uh, the pieces of legislation where Catholic rights uh, are made very clear. Um, and then lastly, there are, uh, we've updated a policy change, um, again, to make sure that we're, we're actually highlighting the appropriate policy. Uh, with respect to records management and information policy. Uh, and uh, we also bring regular reports to the Board of Trustees, Human Resources Activity Reports. So they come on a regular basis, uh, pretty much uh, monthly. Uh, so to say that we are reporting annually through the director, um, we do that more frequently. So that's the reason for that change. So uh, happy to answer any questions. I'll open the floor for discussion. Is there any questions, comments? Okay, so we'll start with Trustee Carabella and then we'll do Trustee DeRosa. Thank you, to you uh, Madam Chair. Um, so you said this was from two 2012. So I just um, recall as trustee and in camera that we would, um, um, when we would be, I don't know if this is in camera or not, or can I say? Yeah, this is public. Um, sometimes things would come to us for approval. And um, I d I'm looking at the bullet the in the principles, the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet, page two of three, um, that sometimes things come to us for approval and in camera. So I thought that um, to change here 
that the Director of Education is the sole empl employee of the elected Board of Trustees and reports directly to the Board. All authority of the Board to hire um, I was gonna, senior staff and system chaplain is delegated through the Director of Education. I was going to add those. Uh -oh. And um, do I, with final approval of the Board of Trustees in camera. So I wanted to have that as a discussion. Or Sorry, can I just clarify? So yeah. you're looking to add into this? Or I'm looking to add, so amending it by adding all authority of the Board to hire senior staff and system chaplain is then delegated through the Director of Education and then add with final approval of the Board of Trustees in camera. And the remainder stays the same? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do, do, do we have any other discussion on this? Okay, so, oh, sorry, Trustee DeRosa, do you have anything in regard? Uh, and I had a point of Annually set a particular time frame at least to report once. Um, does this contemplate that an update can go beyond a, a certain period of time as required? What does that really mean? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, uh, as I had indicated, uh, there's a human resources activity report that comes monthly where we report, um, you know, what's happening with respect to generally hiring um, and who is being appointed to positions of responsibility. Um, so we would uh, be reporting and we do report on a regular basis all promotions um, and uh, appointments of positions of responsibility. So um, our view when we are reading that, that's not an annual report, that's something that comes to you monthly. Uh, unless there is not something to report. Thank you. Uh, I believe Trustee, uh, Trustee Carabell, I haven't forgotten about you. We'll just, we're just, if there's any other discussion in regards to Trustee Trinado. A little background. So your request is in the policy. It says that we are delegating our responsibility through the director to hire staff. So for if I am correct, you want that to be delegated through the director except for hiring senior staff? Is that what you're, or am I a misunderstanding? I wouldn't, uh, through you, Madam Chair, I wouldn't say except for. I would say that it's all he, he would delegate and find the, but presented to us in the in camera meeting for final approval, and then it goes to the public meeting. Okay, so instead of giving it, it to us as information, we would have an opportunity to say no to those choices? Yes. Well, an I'm opportunity to approve, yes, to say yes, mostly, so 99 you know, percent, but it's just that that is like a, a process that it does come to us to, to approve. May I ask why do you want that capability? Um, I just, uh, through you, Madam Chair, that I was just remembering that, and maybe I'm, that we have in the past have voted on uh, these issues. So sometimes, but I've noticed we haven't as well. So it's just to make it consistent. Yeah, again, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the, the system chaplain piece as a, as a, maybe some context. So the, the system chaplain needs to be a Approved by uh, by the bishop, right? And so, when we hire a system chaplain, you know, part of our process is to consult with the chancery office to go and make sure that they're fine with that appointment, and then we just bring that as information to the board of trustees. So, um, 
you know, we would have a process that we need to follow, um, similar to we have a procedure that we would follow with respect to senior staff, and that there is involvement uh, of, of uh, a, usually the chair of the board or the vice chair of the board in the selection of, of a senior staff person. Uh, ultimately, the director has the sole responsibility for that and then reports uh, the hiring uh, to the Board of Trustees uh, as information. That, that's our practice. Thank you. Uh, sorry, we've got Trustee O'Brien, then Trustee Murphy, and then Trustee Antomasi. Thank you, through you to Madam Chair. Um, first, I want to say I think our Human Resources Department does a wonderful job of selecting and promoting candidates. Um, I mean, you see the strong leadership in the schools, the teachers we have. Um, I guess I'm asking the opposite question. Um, why is it presented to us as information? That, that's the question I'm asking. Um, because it, it just seemed to kind of um, take away our, our, our governance of, of, of approving the, the good job that HR does. So do, do you want to... Okay, so we'll go to uh, Trustee Murphy. Um, it's <laughs> has so many quotes. So, but after that training, I will now speak very vanilla. Um, so, in here, we, the Board of Trustees, shall entrust the day to day management of the board uh, to its staff through the, the Director of Education. So that's what our purpose is. That's, and you read in the Education Act, it's very clear. But now we're saying, no, we're not doing that. You can bring candidates to us and the trustees will now assume that role. So we're now encroaching in the day-to-day -day management of the board by hiring, which is not our role and not our expertise. So I think it's problematic. Uh, I think it's, in my opinion, don't take offense, it's micromanaging in an area that's not our responsibility. And the last thing we should be doing is encroaching into those areas. Thank you, Trustee Murphy, Trustee Ann Tomasi, and then Trustee O'Brien, I have you back down. Through you, Madam Chair. So, trustees have governance over policy. If you have governance over policy, you're establishing what our secretary in this room can and can do. Under the Education Act, we are entitled to review and pass. The reason this information comes to us is because we pass it. So we do have jurisdiction. Uh, Trustee O'Brien and then Trustee DeRosa. Okay. Uh, just one clarification, responding to uh, Trustee Murphy. We're not actually asking to be involved in the hiring, but the, the approval. Of higher, I think there's a, a difference. Um, and I, let me just finish. I, I'm looking at this governance document that I got. That we all received, and it talks about governance, and it's, it's, it's kind of a hot topic. And it says, um, as a rule of thumb, this is, I'm just reading this, okay? As a rule of thumb, good governance means trustees have their noses in and fingers out. Um, but, but it seems to me right now that as far as the approval of um, superintendents, we, we don't have our noses in at all. Our noses and nose are turned away, and it's kind of given to us as a done deal. So noses in implies to me that there, there is some kind of influence over the decision making. And, and I feel right now we have, well, I don't feel right now, I know we have absolutely no say about who those superintendents are. So I think it's a, it's a valid point. Secretary Daly. Um, thank you, and through you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I would say noses in is um, uh, trustees are in the interview process. Fingers out is um, the, the, the director ultimately uh, makes a decision on who that uh, who that person is. I'd also remind trustees that uh, by the Education Act, the position of director is the one position in the board explicitly stated in the act that trustees are involved in hiring. Trustee DeRosa and then Trustee O'Brien. Um, uh, you know, I, I hear arguments on both sides, but I need
need to voice my uh, Trusty Murphy's uh, sentiments to some degree because how's that? What concerns me about this discussion to some degree is that uh, um, it's a slippery slope to other to other situations and um, what keeps coming up is the degree and the line, the blurring line between operations and uh, and what our governance role is. Um, I think to some degree we all need some guidance on that and I'm actually um, quite anxious to for the session that's coming up on October the 5th to hopefully clarify a lot of these things through uh, third party voices. So um, a precipitated decision tonight on this is problematic from my standpoint. Um, I think by now everybody knows that uh, what my personal views are on, on governance and um, uh, our role is an oversight role, not an intrusive role to try to manage the daily operations. And I'm, I'm concerned about uh, the direction that this particular uh, question takes uh, tonight on this policy. Thank you, Trustee DeRosa, Trustee O'Brien, and then Trustee Antima. Okay, um, thank you, through you, Deputy Chair. I want to just respond to what um, Director Daly said. Um, um, one trustee in an interview process selected by the director, to me that doesn't really represent the board and as a bo at that person, we, we don't really get to voice our opinion through that person about any part of that process. So I, I think that's, um, that's really not a good analogy of, of, our, of a board input on that, that interview process, in my opinion. Secretary Daly. Um, just to clarify, uh, our procedure says up to two trustees. Trustee Antomasi. So I go back to, um, so if the policies belong to the trustees, how do we have governance over the policies if we do not take part in that particular process? How do we ensure that all the policies are being followed and they're not skewed by anything on the other than personal preferences when you're hiring somebody? I think we can be a voice whereby we're able to be to discern and, 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 and look at all candidates equally without giving preference to anybody that may be the buddy of or friends with. Was that a question to me? No. Uh, so I'd like to make two comments. I'll say two comments because I'm going to forget one and then you guys can remind me I had another one. So the first is, uh, yes, the, the trustees create policy. Creating the policy is not then to insert ourselves into the operations. So that's like getting a genie, getting three wishes, and my first wish is a thousand wishes. It doesn't work that way. So yes, we create the policy, then senior staff uh, formulates the procedure. So the second part of that question, which I remember, is so you, people say, okay, when you hire uh, people to do a job, the implication is that they're going to do that job. You're not then going to structure uh, policies and procedures to, um, with the assumption that they're not going to do their job. So part of, of hiring people is hiring the right candidate, asking the right questions. There is a group of people that uh, evaluate those candidates, they're ranked, and then uh, the preferential candidate is chosen. So that in and of itself, going through that procedure um, should eliminate nepotism, favoritism, whatever, whatever the case may be. Say you're correct. Say we hi somebody hires a buddy. Well, there are mechanisms in place. There's employment standards, there's contracts, um, there, is, um, uh, there is mechanisms to, to remedy those situations. We can't keep formulating um, rules upon rules upon rules for exceptions. The, the assumption is people are qualified to do their job, they're hired to do their job, then the key is to manage them that, to do their job, not to create uh, levels and levels of bureaucracy to make sure that all these little steps are followed. 
and, the, and to reiterate, when we create policy, it's not to insert ourselves into the daily operation. Uh, Trustee Intimasi? So, are you telling me that once we write policy, we're finished? Are you, are you asking for, okay, Trustee? Uh, no, there's, so once we write policy, it becomes the board's policy, not our policy. And then that policy, if it is not followed, there's remedies and actions that can be taken. So how do you get the governance? The whole purpose of governance is to ensure, the role of governance is to ensure that those policies are followed. You can't ensure policy is being followed without governance. And since we are elected and we have governance over staff, that it's within our purview to be able to review and look at what is being done and who's being hired. Can I answer that question since it's directed at me? Trustee Murphy, and then we've got Trustee DeRosa, and then I'm going to ask for, I'm going to give a last round for in favor and opposed, and then we'll yeah. talk about. I could be wrong, and, and uh, who the, the correct person could uh, jump in. Uh, I do believe that uh, if you wish to review any uh, action that happened within the board, you would be able to call on the appropriate person and they would be able to walk you through. So for example, we hired a new superintendent. I would assume that if you went to our director and said, um, can I look at the procedure and um, how did you come to this decision, I'm sure it would be uh, an open discussion and you would you would have that information so that is how you would govern that policy not by necessarily being in the room because then where does this stop every single policy there has to be a trustee policeman with his whistle sitting in the corner so I'm I'm gonna pass the microphone over to trustee DeRosa and then trustee Duarte and then I want to give a, a last warning that if we're going to go opposed and in favor, so that because otherwise we can stay here and debate this all night. Trustee DeRosa, you have to okay, I just uh, um, a very simple commentary. We are clearly um, uh, the director reports to us. We have the power to um, direct, evaluate, and judge upon results. Ultimately. Uh, we do have the ability to make policy, but we also owe it to our director to um, let him do the job. Um, with respect to the choice or the hiring of, and please correct me, uh, uh, Superintendent, Superintendent O'Hara on this, but I believe trustees are on the interviewing and commi uh, hiring committee of uh, of. Um, superintendents or assistant superintendents, if I'm not correct. So it's not that we don't have uh, any involvement at all. We have a uh, participation. It's written in policy. And in my view, it's at the proper level. That's fine. It's a procedure. Okay. It's a procedure. The, it's a procedure. That's fine. I'm going to pass the microphone over to Trustee Duarte. Sir, Madam Chair, a uh, question to Director Daly. You mentioned about two trustees being on the interview committee. Uh, how is it done in other boards? Uh, because I did talk to a trustee from the public board, and they said they have a trustee from every region rep represented on the committee. So why did we select two? Can we have representation from every other? That takes care of the fairness part of it. And how is it done in other boards, Hamilton, Wentworth, the Peel Public Board? Can you just tell us a little more about that? Uh, I can't really speak to what other boards do in terms of their process. Uh, our procedure does allow for up to two trustees. Uh, I'm not really sure why an additional one or two or three or four uh, would address a fairness um, issue. I think the process in the, the interview process for senior staff uh, does involve trustee representatives. It's, it's open in the sense that uh, an interview process uh, can be open. Uh, so in terms of what other boards do, uh, I wouldn't want to guess what other boards do I, and um, I, I'll just have to leave it at that. To 
do do we I have okay one Trust more question I, um, I'm gonna do the last round and then I'm gonna pass it back yeah. to trustee Carabella because it was her her thing yes. to get a clarification on what she's looking for thank you to you madam chair so uh, dr. Diddy how do you choose the trustees to be on the interview panel for superintendent uh, in my limited experience so far, it's typically the chair or the vice chair, I think, is selected. Um, that that seems to make sense, but uh, if trustees wanted to think of it in a different way, that that could be something we could look at as well. The, the procedure doesn't really mandate uh, a way to do it. Okay. Trustee Carabella, Thank can you, you just clarify again what the changes, and then we'll go around the table and see. Well, we didn't get a seconder. I didn't. Well, let's let's let's. Can you reread it for us first, and then we'll go that way. If that's if you are making a motion to add this, then? I'm not going to make a motion. So, um, but as we we're discussing, and that I was um, thinking that part in the procedure that is about the trustees attending the interviews, maybe that could be placed into the policy because right now it's in procedures, so maybe we can put it in the policy. Um, some, I don't know how it's written in procedures, but the chair and vice chair of the board or designated trustees will be present during the hiring interview of senior staff and system chaplain. Instead, instead of what you originally proposed? Yes, I'd like to reflect on that before I a bit more, so I'm withdrawing it. as I didn't get a seconder. <laughs> okay, so all right. So let's clarify okay. first what if it is actually a motion that she's okay. putting forward, and then we can figure out what we're seconding before we. Okay, all right. So I will put that as an amendment that the director of education is the sole employee of the elected board of trustees and reports directly to the board. All authority of the board to hire senior staff and system chaplain is delegated through the director of education with final approval of the board of trustees in camera. So just to clarify, so you're reverting back to what you originally proposed? Oh. So just to clarify, Trustee Carabella, so mm -hmm. then you're not looking to add in what's in the, in the procedure in putting in that the trustees... Well, we'll, we'll do this first and then I would... I'll okay. offer that as well. Okay. And so we have a seconder in regards to this, Trustee O'Brien. We've had our discussion already. So let's go around the table and see where everybody stands in regards to this amendment. Yeah. Secretary Diaz. Sorry, I don't want to yeah. make it any longer than, I, than we need to, but um, you can't designate sole authority to the director and then say it's on approval of the trustees. They're, they're two contradictory things. It's either sole authority or it's not. So conjunction with? Um. And I'd also point out that the Ed Act does speak to the role of the director in terms of hiring staff. It speaks specifically to the role of trustees in hiring the director uh, uh, as the sole employee of like the trustees. Point of order. She did speak at the end, so I think we got a vote. Okay, so I just, yeah. I just want to clarify, so we're not looking then, so the, the, we need to clarify what your amendment is because if it doesn't make sense and it doesn't flow, it'll be hard to, to inject into this. Um, so let's clarify what your proposed amendment is. And, and Trustee Carabella, if it's that you would prefer to put in something that's in the procedure that says that trustees will be in attendance with the director, then maybe that's, can I suggest that that might be an alternative? And then this way we know that as opposed to it just being in the procedures, it's actually in the policy. Mm -hmm. the, the other part I would just note is, I'm sorry, and I don't, it's just that really it is true that the director reports to the trustees. Mm -hmm. If we're not happy, I'm not saying that we are, but if we are not happy, mm -hmm. there's a way for that we do have recourse in dealing with that mm -hmm. through that. So that's just how how it's been set. Mm -hmm. I, I seconded a motion. It was very clear to me what the motion was. I think we got a vote on it. We were just looking for... So point of order, we can't vote on that motion secretaries already alluded to, it's contradictory. So
So we do need to change the wording. Um, I think probably a better word would be in conjunction with. Um, I, we're not taking any power away from the director, our secretary. What we're doing is we're reestablishing our role, and our role is well stated in the Education Act that we do play a role in the hiring process so as to ensure that policies are followed because I can tell you several superintendents that have been hired did not meet the qualifications that are stated in our policies. No point mentioning names, but that is a fact. So by having trustees there, we can stay within our policies. Uh, Trustee Murphy and then, or Secretary Daly, sorry, do you want to? Uh, I'm just unclear as to what part of the Education Act says that trustees hire superintendents. So I'm talking again about the policy. So if in our policy that we're reviewing right now, we're giving you a particular power or we're delegating a power to you, then we have jurisdiction over you to ensure that through our governance role that you're doing it correctly. And the only way we can do that is by being there and seeing what is done. Trustee Murphy. Where to start? Uh, I'm not an English major, uh, but sole versus conjunction is a change of authority, clearly. Uh, if, if somebody has sole authority versus, con versus conjunctive authority, two different, I'm not a law major either, but they're two different things. Um, I would say, I would caution to make inflammatory comments about past hiring practices in this forum. I think that is a, a different discussion for, for a different day. And with any uh, role of any employee, um, they have to be able to manage their business. Otherwise, uh, where, does it, where does it stop? Where does it begin and end? So basically, you're taking away the, the teeth from that position. Uh, a CEO who's not allowed to hire his own staff is going to have a difficult time managing that staff and the results overall the organization would suffer. It's, it's a, a poor management structure to try and manage by committee. I have, I have to say okay, so Through sorry, you, Madam Chair. Trustee Carabell, can you just drop off your mic? Sorry. Uh, Trustee Antomasi, and then we're going to, we need to move on from this or we need to maybe take a, a break and maybe defer this to the next meeting because I think that what's on the table at this point is contradictory and I think that what needs to be thought out and maybe we should actually take a look at what the actual procedure is in conjunction with the policy. So, Trustee Antomasi. All authority of the board to hire staff is delegated. So we're delegating to the director, our secretary. And what we're seeing here, or what we're trying to point out, is that we would like that to be in conjunction with, as opposed to delegating our role as trustees. So just, I understand, thank you, Trustee Antomasi and Trustee Carabella, I understand what you're saying. However, the way it reads and the way you've proposed it right now is contradictory, and I think maybe and if everybody's okay with it, I think we defer this to the next meeting so everybody can take a look at it so that we don't spend any more time um, on trying to reword something. Is that okay? Okay. Trustee Antomasi, you move that we defer this to the next meeting. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Trustee Duarte. Uh, we'll take a recorded vote on this. Uh, Trustee O'Brien? On deferring this. Opposed. Opposed? Okay. Trustee Antomasi? In favor. Trustee Carabella? In favor. Trustee Murphy? In favor. Trustee DeRose? In favor. Trustee Duarte? In favor. Trustee Chernalta? Aye. So that's two opposed. Let's see if my math is any good. <laughs> Three, five, five to two, right? Five to two. So the motion passes, the policy will be deferred, and Trustee Carabella, I, I would ask that if you do have some amendments, if you could actually send them to us in advance so that we can take a look at it to ensure that it falls in line with everything else. Excuse me, Madam Chair. <clears throat> we need to 
um, take the motion that was on the table off the table. So do we vote? Yes. The original motion. Oh, can you, do you want to rescind your motion then, Trustee Well, I Fairbanks? think the motion to defer or postpone takes President's president. Over, no? Yes. Yeah. Point of clarification. So, um, three of Madam Chair, if we want to speak to something else in the policy, that's going to be next meeting, right? I, I think, Trustee O'Brien, I think that makes the most sense. Fine. Just so that we can deal with it all at once. Uh, and again, if there is something that you want, I would suggest maybe per, uh, emailing uh, both uh, uh, Superintendent Ballas and myself uh, what your what your proposed amendments are so we can actually show them in advance. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we move on to item 4.3. There was some additional changes. Has everybody received the revised uh, or it's been reposted. Okay, it's been reposted. So, okay. So if everybody is aware, if you can just pull it up in front of you. It's it's minor. I'll point to you exactly what the difference was from what was sent out to us to what the change was. So this is um, item policy III-15, workplace violence. Can I get a motion that the policy committee recommends that policy III-15 workplace violence be forwarded along with amendments to the September 17th, 2019 regular board meeting for approval? Trustee Chernota, seconded by Trustee Duarte. Okay. I'll pass it over to... So the change is, and the only change is, is it's in two spots under purpose Instead of amendment, it's crossed out to say act, okay? And then the second part is under references. Again, instead of amendment, it should say act. Those are the only two changes. Everything else is as presented originally, okay? Okay, Superintendent O'Hara. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, uh, this is another one of those uh, policies that are required to be reviewed on the Occupational Health and Safety Act on an annual basis. Staff have reviewed um, this policy and has made some minor changes. The changes essentially are um, listing a couple of other associated policies and procedures uh, and striking out Bill 168. Again, once uh, a bill is passed into law, it gets folded into the actual piece of legislation, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, the error in terms of striking amendments is every time they put forward a change to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, that bill is called the Occupational Health and Safety Amendment Act. Uh, so the correct terminology is the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, so we've also just clarified striking out definition of and just call it workplace violence and workplace. Uh, so again, minor changes and uh, we're asking that you approve to take that forward to the board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? We'll no? Okay. So we'll go to, oh, trust. Oh, we already moved it and seconded it. Okay. So if there's no discussion on this item, We'll go to a recorded vote. So I'll read the motion again. Is that the policy committee recommends that policy III-15 workplace violence be forwarded along with amendments to the September 17, 2019 regular board meeting for approval. Mm -hmm. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Trustee Ann Tomasi. In favor. Trustee Carabella. In favor. Trustee Murphy. In favor. Trustee DeRosa. In favor. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustee O'Hearns or not. The motion passes. We will present it at the next meeting. Thank you. <sighs> Moving on to item 4.4, policy III-16, workplace harassment. Can I have somebody make a motion that the policy committee recommends that policy III-16, workplace harassment name, be changed to policy III-16, workplace discrimination and harassment, 
be forwarded along with amendments to the September 17, 2019 regular board meeting for approval. Trustee Antomasi, do we have a seconder? Trustee Cernota and Superintendent O'Hara, would you like to discuss? Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. Uh, this particular policy has gone through a, a major rewrite, and the reason for that is that we have combined the harassment policy and the workplace harassment policy into one policy. Um, historically, we had a harassment policy that was based um, essentially under our requirements under the Human Rights Code, and then uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act came in and required some, uh, again, additional uh, wording around workplace harassment and violence, and uh, we created at that time, again, really for efficiency's sake, a workplace harassment policy. And again, there were some slight variances in definitions. Uh, we have worked with our legal counsel and various board staff to take a look at the policy and to merge the, the two into one policy, which would be called the Workplace Discrimination and Harassment Policy. So essentially, as I've indicated, it's a combination of making sure that we're covering off all our requirements under the Human Rights Code and the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and our recommendation is that this policy moves forward, and you'll see later that we uh, eliminate uh, the harassment policy, which would then be redundant. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Do we have any discussion questions? Trustee Carabella. Thank you. For clarification, I'm just wondering about um, how Halton Catholic District School Board, in the purpose, um, how are we legally protected? Like if someone gets harassed or um, discriminated against, is it they come against the board or do they come and they want to sue? Do they come against the person that's harassing them, or how does the legal framework uh, surround that? Thank you. Right. So, uh, again, we're a heavily unionized uh, employer. Uh, there are essentially two things that can happen. Uh, we, we do have a procedure, and so we would expect employees to follow that procedure, and where there's an informal uh, process and a formal process to try to resolve issues. Uh, unionized employees can also uh, file a grievance uh, if they so choose uh, and follow the grievance procedure. Uh, so there are mechanisms in place uh, to resolve issues. Uh, we would take the position uh, that uh, it really does not involve anything outside of uh, our procedures or the grievance process. So uh, yes, if, if an employee has a concern, uh, they would be using the collective agreement or uh, our, our procedures to try to reach resolution. Trustee Antoine. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. So I think the question that I perceived she was asking is which legal entity, is it the Board of Trustees or HCDSB that will be sued? Are we or are we both legally liable as such both parties are sued? Uh, it, it would be the board entity uh, that would be would be sued or grieved. Um, and so, you know, it wouldn't be an individual trustee or, but it certainly, a, and so uh, through uh, the grievance process, uh, it would be, you know, a representative staff would be representing the board entity to defend any kind of allegations or, um, you know, legal challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Trustee Carabella. And for clarification on uh, page three of eight, the second bullet, so um, I'm just wondering if I'm reading it correctly that it's only if, if, it, if their position and if, the, if they're being making a sexual solicitation or advance, when the person making the solicitation or advance is in a position to confer, grant, or deny a benefit or advancement to the worker. So if they're in a higher position. But am I understanding, shouldn't it be like anyone who would do that? 
not just person that has authority. So, uh, again, through the chair, that, that's an example of of what may constitute harassment or, or sexual harassment. Right? So certainly, um, you know, again, the, the, the language in both the um, workplace, her, um, so the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and the uh, Human Rights Code says it's known or ought to be known to be unwelcome. So, um, you know, the reality is is that we do have, you know, two sexes uh, that are, are within the organization and uh, relationships will happen. Um, hopefully they are healthy relationships um, and they're welcome. If they're unwelcome, that can cause issues and cause uh, the policy and the procedure to be enacted. There's no further questions. We'll vote on it. I'll reread the the, poli uh, the motion, which is that policy that the policy committee recommends that policy III-16 workplace harassment name be changed to policy III-16 workplace discrimination and harassment, and it be forwarded along with amendments to the September 17, 2019 regular board meeting for approval. We switch things up. Trustee O'Hearn Zernata. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustee Murphy. In favor. Trustee Carabell. In favor. Trustee Antomasi. Yes. I'll take that as an in favor. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Okay. So the policy passes. Thank you. Moving on to policy 4.5, which is we heard was in conjunction. So unless there's any questions, I'm not going to ask Superintendent O'Hara to discuss it because I think we just covered it. So I'll read the motion, um, if I can find it, yeah, I didn't flip through here, okay, so if I can have somebody make a motion that the policy committee recommends that policy III-06 harassment be forwarded to the September 17th, so no, I should say actually that the policy committee recommends that policy III-06 harassment be rescinded and forwarded to the September 17th. Oh, it says it at the end. I see regular board meeting of the board to be rescinded. I'm going to say it again because I totally messed that up. So that the policy committee recommends that policy III-06 harassment be forwarded to the September 17th, 2019 regular meeting of the board to be rescinded. Trustee Antomasi, do I have a seconder? Trustee Duarte. And we'll go to a recorded vote. Trustee Zernota. Trustee Duarte? In favor. Trustee Duarte? In favor. Trustee Murph? In favor. Trustee Carabao? In favor. Trustee Antomasi? In favor. Trustee O'Brien? In favor. Thank you. Motion passes. Moving on to 4.6. This is the new policy. Can we get a motion that the policy committee recommends a policy II-51 optional French programming early French immersion extended French named be changed to II-510 or 51 optional French programming French immersion and extended French and be forwarded along with amendments to September 17th 2019 regular board meeting for approval at second and third reading. Can I have somebody make that motion? Trustee Zernota, seconder. Trustee O'Brien and we'll open it up for discussion. Okay, okay, so Trustee Carabella and then Trustee O'Brien. Okay, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I'm, I thought we would have a bit of a discussion or on the, um, the uh, report on the uh, feedback. I'd like to thank the community for um, expressing their feedback and that taking it into account. Um, I do want to um, make an amendment again, um, change the wording very slightly, but again, to, to say that as trustees, uh, we, are, we are voted uh, by the ratepayers and that we are to be a voice for the ratepayers. And I think that to be a good voice, that we need to re keep some capacity to be able to um, uh, vote on, especially programming uh, that deals directly with our children. So I was going to propose the following amendment. Uh, it's, it would be it would be an amendment.
amendment to the requirements under one and it it would be one point four one point five point four so it would be the last requirement and again it's to say that um not to relocate and not to um but if if the staff would feel that not feel but uh if if the a decision was being made to eliminate the optional french program or the extended french or french immersion program that as trustees we should be able to vote on that for final approval so i'd like to make the amendment to say when deciding to eliminate an optional french program from halton catholic district school board either the french immersion or extended french a report will be brought to the board of trustees for review and a vote for final approval so that's an amendment so are you making a motion to, to amend? amend yeah okay so it would be 1.5.4 and can you just reread it again for me trustee Kerr? when deciding to eliminate an optional French program from the Halton Catholic District School Board, either the French Immersion or Early fr or Extended French. A report will be brought to the Board of Trustees for review and a vote for final approval. Do we have a seconder on that motion? I'll second that. No, no amendments. Okay. Trustee O'Brien, do we want to have a discussion on that? Trustees or not? What kind of so if they decide so staff decide that we need to eliminate the program at whatever school? What kind of report are you looking for that would help us make that decision along with the staff? Like if they've already decided to eliminate the program, what kind of report are we looking for to validate that decision? I'm just looking for clarification. That's all. Trustee Carabell and then Trustee. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. I would expect like a, a staff report and uh, outlining the reasoning, and then then it comes to us as an action item that we vote on that, whether we agree with it or not, or other suggestions. But that we're we are part of that decision making. If we're going to completely eliminate, not relocate, but completely eliminate French immersion or extended French from Halton Catholic that we should be involved in that decision. Does that clarify it, Trustee Zerona? Okay. Trustee Murphy? Uh, I would agree. We would A staff report would be beneficial to understand the reasoning. Um, but again, we're, we're taking away the authority of the director, uh, which is clearly his authority on uh, programming. Uh, and my concern is that um, we may not have the right tools to make the decision and, and let's play devil's advocate. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that no, anybody around this table would do that, but say you have uh, very vocal constituents and they're uh, a very strong force and the trustee wants to please them. So now we potentially can make a decision that does not benefit all 36,000 students that we're responsible to govern and 4,500 employees, but we're appeasing a very small group uh, who holds some political power or will. I think that's a very dangerous precedent to set. Trustee Antomasi, your light's on, and there's something that you want to... Through you, Madam Chair. Again, um, as part of our governance role, it's the trustees that establish whether a program ceases or, or, or continues. It's not the role of the director or our secretary. That power rests with the trustees. Trustee Dwight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, whenever a program is introduced, it always comes to the board of trustees and we always approve. Uh, similarly, when a program needs to die, for whatever reason, I believe it should come to us for approval or rejection, with due reasons, of course. Uh, besides, uh, we are elected trustees, 
the elected representative, representatives of the people. Uh, our job is to support the needs, student success, and student requirements in the area. I think uh, we need to be proactive and stand for the great peers who have put us here in the first place. Trustee DeRosa, and then. Um, this is the same question on a different topic, and it's the issue of how blurry does that line get or how clearly does it, that line get. I personally myself am not, am not in a position to change anything dr dramatic at this stage of the game without further debate and without further investigation as to exactly the implication of a decision like this, whether it be on programming or whether it be on hiring or whether it be on something else. So we have, uh, we have a desperate need, in my view, around the table to, to get on the same page as to what is operations and what is uh, the role of the board and every trustee, so. Trustee Antomasi. So through you, Madam Chair. So the legal requirement of trustees is to vote publicly, to let the public know if something is continuing or something is ceasing. No decisions can be made in the back room. The decisions all have to be public. And in order for the decisions to be public, they have to come be before us, which means we vote on it. We make the final decision. Trustee DeRosa. Trustee DeRosa. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the only thing I'm bringing into question is uh, um, is not making a decision um, in a hurry right now. I think we need to clarify uh, the whole question of governance, and that's my only point. I'm wherever the decision lies, that's where we got to make sure we put it on the proper side of the line. you, Madam Chair. Perhaps, perhaps Chair DeRosa can tell us the difference between bylaws or Chair DeRosa can explain to us the difference between governance, bylaws, and procedures and protocols. Because We have a different perception of what that is around this table. So um, some of us uh, have an opinion as to where our role is, uh, my, my view, my personal view is that we are not uh, to be intrusive to the point where we are running the operation on a daily basis. So, but this is, a, this is my view. Um, I think every one of us would benefit the guidance of where, uh, of what governance is all about. And all I'm really stating is that a, a a precipitous decision on this is tonight is a, um, not timely. Trustee Carabella and Trustee Antima, and then Trustee O'Brien. I just wanted to bring a point of history to the board that the, the, the way that this policy is written, early French immersion or extended French could be eliminated. Uh, it would come as an information item. Two years ago, it was as a uh, action report. We did vote for it uh, two years ago, and the trustees unanimously voted. I think it was unanimously, or one didn't, uh, to keep early French immersion. So I'm not doing something new. It has been brought to the board for trustee approval. But what I'm seeing is that now it's being taken away, and we are losing our voice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Antomasi, uh, Superintendent Com uh, Cipriano has uh, commented. Do you mind? Okay. Through you, Madam Chair, just from clarity uh, regarding Trustee Carabella's comment about the action report. Uh, in that instance, uh, it was unique in that the uh, it was brought as an action report because the original program was a pilot program that was approved by the Board of Trustees. Uh, there were financial implications. There was community. Uh, there was stakeholder input, and uh, again. Uh, the, the number of years that, uh, ago that the pilot was created escapes me, but it was, uh, I think, we're in year seven. 
And so at that time, that board of trustees, which was different than the previous board, uh, approved a pilot program uh, with some parameters. And so it was decided that it, if it was, dis we, the senior staff had decided that the pilot program would come to an end, that it would have to come back to the board because they had created it through an action, uh, through their action, through their approval, that it should come back as an action for its ultimate demise. And that was the, I believe that was the reason I, I sat in those senior staff meetings, and that was the uh, justification to bring it to the board for their approval through an action report. Trustee Antomasi? Trustee O'Brien? Um, we are talking about the whole closure of a program. So I, I really don't see that as being butting in on the operations of the, of the board. Um, it's, it's an entire program that um, obviously, according to this feedback, our constituents want. So to have it canceled, I think that does rely within our power of governance. And if we don't, then we, we are not being a, um, available and uh, responsible to our, our ratepayers. Thank you, Trustee, uh, Trustee Ternalto. Or to Director Daly. Let's say we have a program that's going to have to end. The, the program's going to end completely. What would that look like as far as the process? If I don't know it, I'd like you to clarify. So what would happen in that instance? The decision would be made to close the program, and then what would happen? What communication would happen with us? Um, through you, Madam Chair. I, I think, um, first of all, based on um, our community consultation process, our new policy, we'd certainly have to explain that to um, our parents and students why we were going to eliminate, as opposed to move a program, to actually eliminate yeah. a program. Um, I think any time we would do that, because of the budgetary um, implications, it would be something that would come before uh, trustees. And um, I, I don't anticipate, uh, I, I can't see at any point where we would want to eliminate French immersion in our board or optional French programming. Um, uh, but I, but I, I think for uh, the elimination of a long-standing program, we'd want to bring it back to trustees. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So I'll reread the. So we've got the amendment on the table. So we'll vote on adding the amendment that Trustee Carabella has proposed. Um, Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Trustee Antomasi. In favor. Trustee Carabao. In favor. Trustee Murphy. Opposed. Trustee Duarte. Opposed. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustee Zernota. Opposed. So that is four in favor, three opposed. So the amendment passes. Um, no. Four and three. Four in favor, three opposed. I'm not voting. I haven't voted on anything tonight. I'm All right. Then we go back to the original motion with the amendments. Um, okay. Um, so we'll, sorry, go ahead. I'd like to make an amendment. If I, are we going to discuss the policy more? A few more. Sure, if there's a further right. discussion, yep. Thank you, through Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank you to the staff for the fantastic um, community feedback. It, it is very comprehensive. And I want to just highlight um, a couple of themes. One in particular, um, theme number one was increased availability. And it says that 51% of respondents expressed the need for increased availability and enrollment in the optional French programming. Uh, specifically by increasing the number of schools that offer such programs. So I, I think um, if over half the respondents did say this, I, I think we have to somehow respond to it. Um, so it seems to me that our, our constituents, our ratepayers, want more. Um, so I'm looking at the um, part of the policy that deals with this um, availability, and I think, in my opinion, the um, under requirements 1.1, it states, um, I'll let you get there, 1.1 under requirements, it states, 
where feasible in, in staffing permits, an increase of program offering of optional French programming will be considered. So I'll read that again, what it presently states. It says, where feasible in staffing permits, an increase of program offering of optional French programs will be considered. Um, since the feedback is really asking f um, for more availability, 51%, um, I would look I move that the word, that the phrase be considered, um, be changed to will occur. So I would, here's how it, it would read, that requirement. Uh, where feasible and staffing permits, an increase of program offering of optional French program, programs will occur. I'll read that again. So my motion is that the phrase would read, where feasible and staffing permits, an increase of program offering of optional French program, programs will occur. So is that a, a motion, That's trustee, my motion for yes, an please. amendment? Okay. My amendment. Do we have a second in regards to that? Brian, could you just repeat it once I again? I will read it again. So Thanks. if you look at 1.1, 1 .1, what it presently states, be considered, I'm going to change to occur. So I, I'll read how it would state. It would say, where feasible and staffing permits an increase of program offering of optional French programs will will occur. That is how I would like to see the phrase stated. Any question? Did you did, do we have a seconder? Yes, sorry, or trustees, we haven't opened it yet. You're gonna you'll second it, okay? So let's open it for discussion. Did you want to start? You want to start? Okay. I, sorry, and I just, I think, and I feel bad because uh, Superintendent Prakasin is here and she probably, I probably should have given her an opportunity to comment on the report before we jumped in. Um, but I also think we also need to take a look too. So when Trustee O'Brien's motion, it's in reference, those comments are, it's only, I think, 29 parents that made those comments out of the 100 and 58 or 48 that, that actually did that, so, okay. I think from a percentage perspective, we're looking around 2% of our population in the French immersion. So just to clarify, the voice of our customer here is 2% of the children enrolled in our program. That's not a big voice of our customer as far as I'm concerned to make any decision. Um, you have 137 parents that responded to this particular uh, report and so when we're looking at our parents we're looking at a potential of grade one to eight I don't have the exact numbers but I'm pleased to look over that and come back with exact numbers for you uh, for the board meeting so we have that in front of us um, but overall when we have looked at the numbers over the past um, and you take all of the optional French programs elementary and secondary we're looking at three percent of our population that you represent. Trustee Antimas and Trustee Move. Through you, Madam Chair. So um, I echo your sentiments, um, Trustee O'Hearn. And I'll tell you the reason why. I've looked at the surveys. We've done approximately 15 surveys this year. Our respondent rate is very, very low. I'm actually very concerned simply because that's telling me we're not reaching our customers. We're not speaking to them. And if we're not speaking to them, then I agree with you. We can't make any decisions on anything. Having said that, when I do look at the surveys, 15 of them, it doesn't deviate from what staff report. And that is, it almost confirms every time. If you're doing 15 surveys, it wouldn't be flatline. It would go up and down the curve because the questions are always going to be different and you're not going to have a straight line response. Like if this were a graph of somebody in a hospital, the patient would be dead because it's straight line it doesn't really tell you anything about what your customers are thinking. Thank you. Trustee O'Brien. Okay, thank you through you, Madam Chair. I agree. Um, the data representation is low. It, it's a problem. Um, 
However, it's it's what we have to work with at this point in time, and, and I feel it does tell us something. And I myself extrapolate when I when I get that kind of data, and I and I, and I even though it's only a certain number, it is still 51% of the people that seem to, to care about it. So um, I, I think it's still a valid voice, and it is 51% is still 51%, um, and I still think it warrants an amendment to this policy. Um, I'd also like to speak to the amendment, because I think the amendment itself gives a lot of wiggle room on both sides. It still says where feasible and staffing permits. So. It, it's giving staff a maneuverability, but it's also, um, I guess, throwing a bone to the ratepayers and at least saying from considered to will occur. So I feel it's a good compromise, and I feel that the, um, the survey wasn't totally in vain, although, yes, I would have liked to see better results. So I, I do hope you will support me in this amendment, and um, at least it's, it does give our these ratepayers an answer some kind of answer. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee O'Brien. I do have a question, if nobody has a question at this moment. Is, by making that amendment like that, is there, and maybe Secretary Daly, you can respond to this, is there not a financial piece that would be tagged to that? Like, is there not a financial implication? Um, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, th there could be, and, and um, just to build a little bit on what Trustee O'Brien said, uh, I mean, feasibility and where staff permits is still it is a lot of wiggle room, so I'm not sure exactly what we would be saying to those ratepayers. We're changing a word to make it look like we're listening to you, or we're changing a word to actually change what we're doing. Um, and certainly around the feedback that we get on um, uh, on policy, it's really not a survey. Um, we ask people to give feedback on the policy. It's really not a survey uh, per se, but I, I would also recognize that the response that we that we've got back on this particular one was fairly low. Um, uh, I'm not sure the amendment commits us to doing anything differently than what we're doing now, which would make me. I guess I would ask why would we make the amendment? But that's just all decisions made around programming have financial implications. <laughs> Let me step back. Step back. Yeah, to step back, listen to the question. <laughs> it's okay. Trustee Antomas. So, um, just one last point. So, it would seem to me that these surveys um, seem to indicate to me that there's some sort of control group that's affecting the results to be so consistent. Because, as I said earlier, um, it, it just 15 surveys. The turnout is extremely low, and it's low as compared to other years. And um, it would seem that there's a, con a control group that we go to that consistently respond, which skews the result in the first place. Uh, thank you, Trustee Antomasi. But just to clarify what Director Daly said, this particular one is a feedback. It wasn't an actual survey. So I think we just, I, I understand what you're saying, but I just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're referencing what it is. Trustee uh, Murphy. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, Trustee Antomasi, you may be correct because it may be only relevant to a very select, specialized group who care about this. And that's why you're getting the same results. 36,000. Uh, or the parents of 36,000 students had an opportunity to reply in 140 some odd because they're passionate about it. It's it's one of their causes and they're driven by it and they're a squeaky wheel. Um, being in the people pleasing business can be very dangerous. If you pull on a, a string, yes, you get the string, but somebody else loses on the other end. Um, being governors and stewards doesn't mean that we're here to make people happy. We have to be uh, practical about our decisions and, uh, and look at all of the students uh, that are impacted by these decisions. Trustee, Trustee Carabello. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I would differ that the data, these people are not data, just data statistics, but it's a child and their education and it's a family and um, they have a right to education. And we've seen, gotten some 
reports with waiting spaces, uh, particularly in Oakville and Milton, that there is interest in the program. So um, this also would address that, that there is an idea of increasing it. Maybe uh, will occur, we could add um, the programs will occur and a report brought to the Board of Trustees for approval could be a way to show that we're working on it and not just, um, just, just a word, but I'm okay with the word and I think, um, yeah. I think all education is important for diversity of programming is important. Trustee Murphy. Uh, I would agree it is, it's an important program. I, I think specifically in Milton, so we're going to take a regular track child out of the school, put them in a portable so we can add a French immersion optional programming. That's hard to justify. So, so now what argument do you have for that parent whose child is being displaced because we pleased somebody on this side? So I, I agree, it's, it's, uh, there is a demand for this program. Specifically in Milton we have a, a great challenge when every single one of our schools is not 101% over capacity, it's 160, 180, 204. Um, adding additional classrooms for optional programs is a problem and it'll have a negative impact on regular track students and those parents' rights are, equally, are equal to the French immersion parents' rights. So it's not an easy fix uh, with a swipe of a pen. It's a complicated matter. Trustee Carabella, Madam Chair, and it does say where feasible, so it's not feasible. So I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna limit this because I think we're just going back and forth, and we've gotten a little off topic and gotten into survey results and okay. customers, et cetera. However, hold on, I think Trustee DeRosa actually had his arm up for a comment, and then you, Trustee O'Brien. It's a comment. Um, you know, we're constantly confronted with with uh, having to. Uh, try to please everybody and um, that's really not realistic. Uh, I think one of the biggest considerations in one, when we're trying to meet the demands of maybe one or two voices or the minority of the voices, one has to consider the impact on the majority. Um, so um, everything we do impacts everybody else as well. Thank you, Trustee DeRosa. Trustee O'Brien. Um, thank you, too, Madam Chair. I, I hear what um, Trustee Murphy is saying. Um, I'd I like to speak to that after this amendment because th there are some other feedback things here. I think it is still 149 people that responded, and I, 148, thank you, Trustee um, Intermassi, and I, I think the voice still counts. Um, so I, I, I think they're worth listening to. And um, through you, I, I, we are accountable. We, we take the phone calls and I, ha I have to, I hear them and I have to deal with them. So we are in some ways in the people pleasing business. So that's what politics is and we are politicians, like it or not. Thank you. Trustee Sernato. Because we're going down a slippery slope as far as I'm concerned, and I'm kind of getting a little offended here. When I spoke about data, I was not negating the fact that I appreciate we have children in our school board. If we could enter all kinds of programs, we would have every program there was in the world. So mine, I wanted to clarify out loud that I do not consider our children a piece of data. My point was for us to make big decisions that affect all of our schools, we need to make sure we've got the proper information to make that decision. Otherwise, that would be foolish and not good governance. Thank you, Trustee Zernota. Trustee Carabella, do you have... Thank you. I'm sorry about that. I did not mean to imply that. Thank you. Sorry. My apologies. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor that Trustee O'Brien, I, I think we've kind of exhausted. We've gotten off topic a little bit and gotten into referencing children as data and et cetera, so. <laughs> Breathe in love, blow out Jesus. Breathe in love, blow out Jesus. Um, so 
We've got an amendment on the table from Trustee O'Brien. Um, we did get a second or two, and I believe Trustee Zernota seconded it. So we'll go to we'll go around the table, and we'll start with you, Trustee Zernota. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustee DeRosa. Opposed. Trustee Murphy. Opposed. Trustee Carabell. In favor. Trustee Antomasi. In favor. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. So that is four to three, correct? Am I right? Am I losing it? Okay. So the amendment is added. Uh, and is there any other? Yes. Okay, Trustee Thank you to you, Madam Chair. Um, I did read every comment. And um, I'm going to switch gears here a bit um, because some of, the, some of the comments were quite rich. And I, I want to read a couple to you. Um, one said that, um, I can just find this. oh yes, page 10, now I'm page 10, I'm on East Christ. this is page 10 of the data report. I'm going to read exactly what this parent said. Uh, French immersion is a charade. The French immersion program has turned into a tool for parents to use to stream their higher achieving students together and segregate them from other students with lower academic achievement. It has become nothing more than that. Now, I found the statement kind of strong uh, myself. Um, however, I, I have taught in three French immersion schools, and I think I know where this parent's coming from um, because th they seem to indicate that it, it, French immersion kind of starts off as one thing and it ends up being something else. And if you go to page 18, um, this comment to me calculizes exactly one of the dangers of French immersion. And I helped write the policy, so I'm kind of going on the other side of the why it's a dangerous thing too. This parent says, behavioral issues should be excused from the program. I'll do it again. So behavioral issues should be excused from the program. So what, I, what I'm seeing here is, is a parent that wants a kind of a a nice little class, a nice little French immersion school inside the regular track stream. And so they're almost looking for like a, like a little private school inside the public school. And I have to admit that after being in these schools, and I taught 20 years in these schools, that, that is a danger. And I'm putting it out to the, to the trustees. I, I, um, I don't know the answer to avoiding that. Um, obviously, these par one parent is basically telling you what they want. The other one is, ex is explaining the, the frustration with that. Um, my, my mentions before of, of withdrawal um, procedures was a way to kind of deter that. So I, if any trustees have a way that they can prevent that, um, I'm really open to that. But it is a danger, and um, I think we got to keep that in mind as we move forward with French immersion. Thank you. So, so just to be clear, Trustee O'Brien and Trustee Murphy, I'll pass it. So you're just bringing a point of discussion? Okay, Trustee Murphy. Uh, you bring up some interesting uh, points, Trustee O'Brien. I grew up in Quebec. I, I know what French immersion is, and I know what it takes for somebody to become bilingual. The reality is we're not trying to do that. We're trying to make them proficient and conversational so so immersion really is a misnomer so let's call it like it is um, and the parent uh, who maybe uses very strong language or has a very strong opinion you have to look at there is some weight to to what they're saying this is this program uh, can this program be enhanced so as to, in my opinion, make it a true immersion program where they are more than just proficient. Going to Quebec City and ordering a double double in French really shouldn't be the the goal of this program, right? So um, if it is just another level of achievement and it's something another ribbon you can put on your wall, then then again, that's maybe not something we should be spending our time on. Do we have an opportunity to look at this program and make it into something uh, which in my opinion, and take this with a grain of salt, strictly my opinion, is of true value at the end of this? 
Um, I think there is a possibility there, but it's it's something probably different than what we're doing now. So I don't have the answer. I'm just saying, based on on my experience, I, I look at our program and I have a. Uh, I'm trying to find a, a, a very polite term, uh, a different opinion of of the value of it. If that if that is a correct way of saying it. Thank you, Trustee Murphy. And Trustee Antomasi, um, Superintendent Percasson has a comment. Do you want to allow her to go first? Or? I'll defer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, um, the purpose of the program is, as you said, to be functionally proficient. And I think through all of this, uh, these conversations we have had around optional French programming in our board, um, we have somehow, I think, given the impression that we're not uh, providing quality programming, and on the contrary, uh, we are fighting to provide quality programming, which is why we are trying to ensure that we're not adding more, spreading it out, and not doing as good a job as we want to. We have high standards of excellence. We have a great number of students that are doing impressive work in passing the DELF exam. I look forward to bringing those results to you to celebrate that because I think it's very important. We have a French itinerant that is dedicated only to working with French teachers, no other subject area, and we're very proud of that work and the professional learning that we do together as a team. So we do have very high standards. Um, I completely agree with Trustee O'Brien. It is a very exclusive program in the sense that there are people that view it as an opportunity to segregate their children. So therefore, we do in grade seven and eight make every effort to integrate our students with the other student body so that they can become less segregated and integrated into the grade seven and eight environment. We can always do better. Um, however, the ministry outlines what they want our optional French programs to look like, how they want them to appear, and its functional proficiency is our goal. Um, retention of our students is our goal, and right now the ministry outlines and guides what those programs look like and what the curriculum is going to look like. So it is in keeping with what we feel that we're doing, and it is um, actually our high standards of excellence and wanting to do the best that we can do that makes us look at our programming and review our staffing and make sure that we have the best people delivering the best programs that we can in our system. So I'm very proud of the work that we do, and I know there's been a lot of conversation around um, reducing programming, but it is only because we want to ensure that we have the right number of staff and the right qualities of French, the fluency of French that we want in our classrooms. So yes, we do look forward to making sure that the people that we hire who are French speaking have a caliber of French so that those students can truly sense immersion, can hear French spoken all the time. But we also have, most respectfully, and I don't mean this inappropriately, French schools that if people choose to go to French schools, and certainly now in secondary school, both parents do not have to be French speaking, not even one parent has to be French speaking. So if people are, for whatever reason, displeased with the programs that we offer, there are options. But we're governed by the ministry's optional French programming expectations, and I feel that we do a great job in meeting those. Thank you. Trustee Antimas. Through you, Madam Chair, she covered exactly what I was gonna ask. It was nice to hear from her for a change instead of you, Trustee and Tomasi. No, I'm joking. Um, okay, is there any other items for discussion? Thank you for the comment. Okay, Trustee Caravella. One last discussion uh, about the sibling acceptance because that came up a lot in the, um, in the uh, feedback as well. And, well, cross borders and, and uh, sibling acceptance. So um, I guess my question is, is there a way that that can be combined with the lottery that a certain amount of spaces could be allotted for siblings, um, maybe not 100%, but a certain percentage to, to somehow address that issue of families getting split up. Are we looking for, are you looking for Superintendent Through you, Madam Chair, certainly I can respond to that. I, I just want to clarify that that's 19 of 148 respondents of approximately thousands of parents potentially that could have applied to this uh, feedback. Um, so looking at it uh, from a numbers, a strictly a numbers perspective, we can certainly provide a fulsome report on what that would look like potentially in our board. As I stated before, informally, there are many families who have three, four, five children, and therefore potentially if the sibling rule exists, 
we could be filling up our schools and programs in spaces we don't have based upon a promise we should not be making uh, through any kind of registration process. Uh, so we moved to a lottery process because people felt that uh, the process we had before was very unfair and inequitable and we moved to the lottery process. The sibling rule, while certainly um, if it was feasible, it would be very nice to do, uh, but I believe there's a number of factors to consider that um, we would have entire families, perhaps four or five families, occupying an entire class based upon the numbers of their students. And a lot of this has to do with cost, has to do with busing, has to do with space in the English programs leading up to uh, the K programs, or in the case of extended French, space in the grade one to four. So this is a very big financial transportation uh, space conversation that may need to be had, and not the least of which is, as uh, Trustee O'Brien pointed out, what we are doing with the regular track students. And we are certainly already, and I'm not sure that uh, trustees may be aware of this, but I certainly am hearing from parents from St. Mary's School in the regular track program very concerned about the regular track program at that site. Thank you. Trustee Dwight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, giving the second child an opportunity uh, skews the results. Uh, it changes the probability of a child getting to the program. If you are going to get the second child too, along with the first child, it's not fair to everybody, as I said before. So I, I agree with Superintendent 100% uh, that it has got other implications. Uh, besides, I have three children, three different schools doing the French program, and and it it all falls into place. So I wouldn't uh, like to push for the. Uh, second sibling getting into the program because one child has gotten into the program. Ultimately, we have three kids and everything works out fine. So we have a good system in place. I think we should follow that system. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, uh, sorry, Trustee Duarte. Trustee Zernosa. Awesome. Just for clarity that I heard what I thought I heard. So I'm... I'm not for the sibling rule. I haven't had been talked into it at all, so I'm waiting to be talked into how that's a better way to do it, but I haven't yet. But what I heard you say at the very beginning is there's a potential if a family has, and good for them, three, four, five kids, that if we enact the sibling rule, let's say, that we may not even have a program for that fifth child down the road because we don't know what's going to happen because we don't have a crystal ball. Is that what I heard? Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly, I think that that is something that needs to be considered. In other words, the program exists as long as there is interest, and we already see that there are uh, there is an issue with interest in our optional French programs in Georgetown for whatever reason. But it has happened both in um, early French immersion as well as extended French. So this does happen from time to time. So optional programs, whether they're French or whatever else they are, exist. At the, um, you know, at the will of the parents and whether they have interest in it. And certainly there are areas um, in proportionate that may want more programming than they would in other situations. But certainly uh, we'd be happy to come back with a little bit of a discussion report or a staff report on the sibling uh, issue and what it would look like. Um, that's something that uh, certainly we can work with with Fred Tebow and planning and do a more fulsome explanation of what that would look like so that uh, we can all make um, you know, a decision that's based upon the facts rather than just a discussion. Where do we put these children? That could be a whole other kettle of fish down the road. Trustee Carabella? I think with that, too, you could make a provision that the sibling rule doesn't take precedence over decisions to relocate or, you know, we're not bound by the sibling rule to keep a program. That could be phrased somehow. I have a question to you, Trustee Carabella. By enacting a sibling, does it not take away the whole essence of a lottery? The lottery is, is one way to get in. Once I, I have used this word before, the family equity, that it gives you family equity to not split up families. So once you get in, 
then I think once anyone gets into the program, they would like it to be a family or sibling acceptance. It's, it's getting in, right? But once they're in, they would like it for their other children. Um, and then it keeps the family together. They're already a committed family going forward, like a bit French mentality and, um, you know, uh, committed. So that's why I was wondering if there's like a way to have a proportion. Um, if, but I don't know if first come, first serve. But further, but further to that, though, just to expand on that, if we were to look at it here, then what about uh, students that apply for the AP program or the IB program or are accepted into gifted, then should we automatically allow for a sibling cross-boundary? Like, I think what it does is it opens it up. I understand the whole point of keeping a family unit together, but I think we need to remember that this is optional programming. This isn't guaranteed. Our, our mainstream is, is English. We are an English board. The French is something that we offer, that we're able to offer and we're able to continue. There's two parts that I'm just trying to understand in regards to lottery. Uh, is a lottery is a way of making it fair and equitable as opposed to standing outside at 6 o'clock in the morning and hoping that you get a slot. Um, two is if we allow those siblings in, then that means there's four, there's two, three, four other families that no, are now eliminated from being allowed to get into that program. So that's, that's where I'm, so where do, we, where do we draw the line when it comes to that's my question in regards to the sibling rule. And I understand, but in a perfect world, we all know that we all have ideas of where we want our children to go and how we want them. We would love them all to be in the same school and whatnot, but that's not necessarily what happens. Things happen throughout. Gifted programs come out, AP, IB. I, I agree. I, I would like some kind of that's why I was asking if there's a way to do proportions or, you know, you know the first. Yeah, anyways, but I would be interested if we could have some more understanding on everything that gets affected by the uh, sibling policy. Could we maybe see what that looks like before it gets to the next, after it's going to the second reading, correct? this next board reading. Oh, it's combined second. So can we, you can, can, also, you can also separate, have it go for second reading only and then have the more reports and then a third reading. That's another. So would that satisfy you, Trustee Carabella, to see and, and Superintendent Percasson, is that something we can do? Once again, repeat exactly what we are going to be doing. So, if it's the uh, if it's only the second sibling policy, then I don't know if you want to go to a vote right now. We're not going to go to okay. a vote because Trustee Carabella, we we're asking that there, uh, Superintendent Prakasin is going to come back. We're going to do we're going to separate the readings. So we're going to do the second reading at this next board meeting, which means it'll go to a third, which allows us to bring this back to policy. And Superintendent Prakasin will be able to bring us some more details on on what the effects are if we were to enact the sibling rule, what it looks like. Basically, I'm not going to change my opinion about that because the second sibling, but I don't know if you want to do an exercise, that's fine. I, I don't think, either way, it doesn't change the readings. It, it still has to go through, it'll still go to second and, and then it'll come back again, so. Can we just know? So is that your motion then, Trustee Carabella? Do we have a seconder to that? No, it's it's there's there's no it will the main motion will be instead of it second and third readings combined, it would be we would separate them for a second and in between there Superintendent Percasson would come back with I guess statistics on what the sibling if we were to enact the sibling are allowing siblings automatic entry into the program, what the effect would be. Correct. Questions? Sure. How are you going to get those statistics? 
So how will you know what families, what children are going to be want, want to be in French Immersion? Sorry. Well, thank you for the question uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, of, of course, um, uh, my immediate thought is to go to someone else, um, but um, our planning department. Our planning department has, uh, can take a look at what our numbers are and take a look at what the siblings are and what the potential ramifications would be. Uh, and then we can also talk to facilities when it comes to space and then transportation if it need be and the whole cross-boundary perspective. So it's, uh, it's really more information that I would gather rather than present myself, but I think that we could, um, we, and we have already discussed this obviously because we know that it is of interest to uh, some of our parents and it has come up before, and so it is something um, that um, Fred Thibault has already looked at in a preliminary way, so it's just a question of polishing that up and bringing it to your attention. So we have a motion on the table. Do we have a seconder? Okay. Trustee O'Brien seconds it for the report. We've got it all now, so it would be second reading. Then we'll go to a recorded vote. Because I think. So, trust. Did, um, do we want to take. Can we take like a two minute break to wait for Trustee DeRosa to return before we vote on it? And two minutes is up. Trustee, so Trustee DeRosa, what we have on the table is a, a, an amendment to the policy, which is um, to separate second and third reading. So it would go for its second reading. Um, and Superintendent Percassin is going to, based on the motion that Trustee Carabella has brought forward, is going to work with, um, the with the planning department to look at what the, if we were to enact a sibling rule for the French programming, what kind of impact it would have um, before we make any further amendments to allow siblings in, okay? So we're at the point where we're voting. Are, are you? Voting yes. Okay. I, I just wonder if it's cleaner if we have one motion to separate and then a second motion directing the staff report. I don't know if that's clearer or not, or if I'm confusing the issue. Sure. So. I would assume we start with this, let's separate it first. So can we make a motion to separate the reading? Trustee Carabella? Sorry, Janine, are you are you good? Okay. Can we get a seconder? Trustee Antomasi. So this is to vote on separating the readings. So we are going to do a second reading, come back to policy, and then do a third reading. Okay? Trustee Zernota. Trustee Dwarf. In favor. Trustee DeRose. In favor. Trustee Merck. In favor. Trustee Carabella. In favor. Trustee Antomas. In favor. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Motion passes. So now we'll deal with the second motion, and I'm and Trustee Carabella, would would you like to make the motion again so that um, we'd ask um, that we ask for a I don't know if it's a staff report. I don't know if that's the yeah. Did you call it a staff report or a report? Because uh, it's going to come to the policy meeting, but a, a, re a report um, describing um, describing the uh, the effects of a potential sibling acceptance policy, effects and ramifications, or effects. Yeah. Oh right. Thank you. Into the French program. Do we have a seconder? Okay. Trustee O'Brien. So I think we've had enough discussion, so we'll go around. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Trustee Antoine. In favor. Trustee Carabell. In favor. Trustee Murphy. In favor. Trustee Dorot. In favor. Trustee Dorot. In favor. Trustees are not. Motion carries. Should it go to the board meeting? Does that matter? 
It, it'll have to come back to policy. That it's supposed to, it, when it goes through the readings, just like when it went through the first reading, that's why it's back here again before it goes. So if there's any further amendments based on the last reading. And, and not only that, I think in all fairness, we've now asked them to do, to run stats, to have it done within a short period of time might not be. So point of clarification, it will go to this week's board meeting with the amendments that we voted on tonight. Correct, for second, for second reading. It has to be passed at the next yep. board meeting, and then at that point it'll come back to policy for a third reading, before it goes for its third reading, right? So it'll come back again to policy in our October meeting. We'll have another discussion. Superintendent Perkassen will have the statistics and the effects for us at that point, hopefully. Um, and then any further amendments that need to be made based on feedback or further discussion, then it goes for its third reading at the October board meeting. Are we all good? Okay. Now ask me. So we need to go back, or we're done then, so this is, we need to go back to the amended motion and vote on it, which is to bring this forward with all the amendments to the next board meeting. So we have, uh, we had, uh, we had a mover and a seconder, so now we'll do a vote with the amendments. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Trustee Antomas. In favor. Trustee Carabell. In favor. Trustee Murphy. Opposed. Trustee DeRosa. Sorry. Sorry, Trustee DeRosa. Opposed. Trustee Duarte. In favor. Trustees are not. Motion passes. Policy will be presented for the next reading at the next board meeting with the amendments. Now we're on to item 4.7. This is the new policy, um, student use of service animals in schools. Um, so just to bring some attention to it, um, to the trustees, if you had read this prior to yesterday, there were some additions into this policy um, when they were made yesterday, do you, does anybody need me to bring them to your attention, or have you all had a chance to read through them? Absolutely. So if we go, so we're looking at policy. We're looking at policy II-52, student use of an service animals in schools. This is item 4.7 on the agenda. So if we're looking on the first page of the policy, under commentary, the fourth paragraph is a new addition and it says on September 9th, 2019, that's where it starts, is everybody with me? Oh, it actually is in the action report? Okay, so it's in the action report. It's all spelled out where it is, so that's one of the, the additions that was made. Sure, um, I was gonna do the motion first. Do you want me to do all of that first and then you can speak to it? Or? Okay. Um, so that was added um, and it's noted in Appendix B as well to reflect it. And then on the last page, page three of, or sorry, page one of three on the actual policy number II-52, it's just, it's in red. You can see policy slash program memorandum under references, that was added. And then under requirements on page three of three, it's in red again. That's at the addition, and PPM 163, School Board Policies on Service Animals. Okay. So can I get a motion that the Policy Committee recommends that Policy II-52, Student Use of Service Animals in Schools, be forwarded to the September 17, 2019, regular board meeting for approval at second and third reading. Uh, Trustee Antomasi, seconder. Trustee Zernota. And I will pass it over to uh, Superintendent Ballo for, or Superintendent Cipriano. That's why I'm here tonight. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ballow, for putting me last on the agenda. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, I present Policy 
uh, 52 student use of service animals in schools. Uh, this policy was first brought to this policy committee in June, approved in first reading at our June board meeting and went out for stakeholder input over the summer from June 19th to August the 9th, 2019. The stakeholder input is attached as part of your package for your review. Most of the concerns raised in the stakeholder review are reflected in some way in the policy in general terms and will be more uh, accurately addressed in the procedure once it's completed. Our working group, uh, just a reminder for this special education, uh, well, sorry, for this policy was made up of special education consultants, our coordinator. Uh, we have a secondary principal, elementary principal on that committee, as well as myself as a superintendent of special education uh, for the draft uh, that we worked from our draft PPM. Uh, as you'd indicated to the board this, uh, this evening, uh, just coincidentally, just timely, the Ministry of Education released the official PPM, Policy Program Memorandum 163, just yesterday. So it has become official as of yesterday. Uh, in the original draft PPM, you may recall the expectation was that school boards have policies in place for September 2019. This has been now amended to January 2020. Uh, we are well on our way to have that date and have our policy in place by then. Uh, we're, uh, our next steps will to be, if this passes uh, this evening and at the board meeting in second and third reading, our next steps will be to create an accompanying procedure with the templates, responsibilities, staff responsibilities, and actions that schools have to undertake when a request is made to schools for a service animal for a child. Uh, this procedure, with all the details, will be presented at a policy meeting, at an upcoming policy meeting, for your information once that is completed. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you. Is there any questions? Just a comment through you, Madam Chair. Um, so I've had opportunity to um, review uh, the policy that's um, been put forward by HCDSD, right? That's a public board. HD. HD, sorry. And, and other ones, and I, and I have to admit, this is a very comprehensive and well thought out. Uh, it's inclusive and it's fair, and it takes into consideration all the students, because um, as we know, there are students that are allergic to animals, so um, I like the the policy the way it reads. I would recommend to adopt it. Okay, if there are no further comments or questions. Thank you. We'll go to a vote. Um, Trustee Zernalta. Trustee Dwyer. In favor. Trustee DeRoth. In favor. Trustee Murphy. In favor. Trustee Caraballo. In favor. Trustee Antum. In favor. Trustee O'Brien. In favor. Thank you. Moving on to item five, discussion items, 5.1, policy II-09, opening and closing exercises. Uh, this is an information item, so I'm gonna pass it on to Trustee Zernold. So my fellow trustee, um, Ms. Agnew and myself um, have been discussing um, in II-09 under the heading requirements, the fifth point, if you'd like to get there, let me know when you're there, which states the oath of citizenship shall form part of every opening or closing exercise. Students and staff shall participate in the oath of citizenship. Okay, I stand corrected. Um, anyhow, so going on, what we'd like to talk about is we would like to discuss the removal of the oath. Ultimately, the plan is to put the motion on the table at the next policy meeting as an action item. We, and I am asked, and I'm reading some of what Ms. Uh, Trustee Agnew has written down, I am asked all the time by parents why we have this in place and when can we have it changed. I've also been um, asked that as a chair at an elementary school and now as a Catholic school trustee, why do we have it? Why do we have to do it every day? Uh, being Canadian today means understanding in our perception and accepting our diversity and multiculturalism. That being a true independent country means we're respectful to but not subjects of a foreign monarch. What about students in our system who are not yet citizens? They cannot take the oath, so that leaves them out. Is that really inclusive for all? And we live in Canada and are citizens of this country and we show our patriotism through the singing of the national anthem. As a Catholic faith-based board, we show our faith through morning prayer. 
Why do we need to pledge an oath to a foreign monarch who lives overseas? We are an independent nation and should not be having our children swear allegiance to a foreign ruler. With all that information behind me, I open that up to the floor for discussion, pros and cons, why it was brought in to begin with, and what we think we can do about it moving forward. Thank you, Trustee Zernota. Any, any, uh, right, do we have any comments, questions? Thank you. Uh, that was quite detailed. Thank you, Trustee Zernota. And I guess pass it on to Trustee Agnew as well. So, uh, Trustee Antomasi. Through you, Madam Chair, I can't help myself. So, um, a couple of points. Uh, number one point, um, you're saying that students that aren't Canadian yet um, can't recite the oath. Part of the, the process of becoming a Canadian citizen is accepting the system as it is, the system being parliamentary. Under parliamentary governance, we are. The monarchs is represented, or sorry, monarchy is represented by the governor general. So in essence, we are still beholding to the Queen, to the royalty, UK. Thank you, Trustee Intimassi. And I offer up to you, having said that, and that being true, as I did some research also on that, do we need to say that every day? I, through you, Madam Chair, to Trustee O'Hearn, I wasn't suggesting that I agree with it. I'm, I was just commenting on some of the points that you made. And duly noted, and I've questioned that myself as I did research. It's not necessary to the Queen, it's pledging allegiance to our country. Um, if some of our new citizens have not become official Canadian citizens, they have not said the oath of allegiance. I'm wondering if you have any history on why we decided to bring that in in the first place. Uh, sorry, I, 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 as much as I'd love the, ba <coughs> the back and forth, I'm going to actually pass it, Trustee Intimasi, on to Trustee DeRosa and then Trustee Murphy because they also have some comments. So. For you, Madam Chair. Trustee DeRosa. My turn now? Thank you. Through you, Ma Madam Chair. Um, you know, this is not to deny our, our history, and we do have a rich history, no question. Um, but when are we going to start teaching the fact that we are Canadians? and acknowledging the fact that we have, how old is this country, 150 years old? We have many, many things to be proud of. And I think uh, if we're gonna instill some sense of pride and patriotism, it, begin, it begins very early in the classroom. We can teach our history for what it is, but we have repatriated our constitution years ago. And I think uh, we've got to come into our own as our own country uh, with all the pride that comes with it and we need to start teaching it in, in, in the schools. Thank you. Trustee Murphy and then Trustee Antima. Thank you, through you Madam Chair. Um, I'll set aside all of my uh, ancestral and historical uh, disdain for certain regimes. So we'll, we'll put that aside, uh, Trustee O'Hearn. Um, on March 17th, we can talk about those. Uh, I, I look at it as, is this relevant in our modern society? It's, it's ceremonial and, you know, it, people will say, well, what's the big deal? It doesn't really matter. Uh, to me, it, it doesn't bear any real relevance. So really, why are we saying it? I would like to see it replaced by a, diff a different oath, you know, or you want to call it the Halton Catholic District School Board oath, and we can incorporate... Uh, the law, you know, we, uh, the last line is very relevant, right? We'll faithfully observe the laws of Canada and fulfill our duties as Canadian citizens. That's that's very relevant and that's very poignant and valid. The rest of it, not so much. So I would, I support your initiative. I would like to see it replaced by our own oath. If we can do that. Trustee Antomasi. Through you, Madam Chair. So, we have a parliamentary system. And because we have a parliamentary system, which we practice right in this room, the Queen is the head of it. Whether we like it or not, constitutionally, she's the head of our government. She's represented here in Canada by the Governor General. 
from that point of view, she does play a role, and it's not redundant, it's actual factual. So um, does that mean that I support keeping it? Not every day, um, and uh, I would be open to replacing it with something else. But to answer the question, it's in our Constitution. Trustee Carabella, Trustee O'Brien, and then I, if there's nobody else, I'd like to add a comment and myself onto the list. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. So I think that if we already have it, that um, we can we maybe look at it once in a while, not every day, not the daily, but it's already printed, it's already there, something that could be said around important days, the beginning of the year or um, Victoria Day, things of importance like that. And... Um, the history is that it got basically changed from being, I think, each principal can decide also to do that as part of the Education Act, and that was the idea to bring it in as part of the Education Act. And um, So, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Trustee O'Brien. Uh, thank you, um, Trustee uh, for bringing this up because I, it's due many people have brought to my attention that it should have been brought up um, thank you for the courage and yourself um, Trustee Agnew for, for doing that I, I, it seems to me you're not looking to eliminate it it seems to me you're looking to kind of give it its proper place and we are a constitutional monarch the Queen does have her place in our country so it seems to me you want to just not set every day um, it'd be nice to find out what other boards are doing. It'd be nice to find out what it exactly says in the Education Act. I, I did not know it was in the Education Act, so it can be given its proper place. I would like to see it replaced by something. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I'll say my piece. I, I'd like to say, see it replaced by the Our Father because that ties ties to who we are and it ties it to the, to, the, to the Eucharist, which is not said in the morning. But that's just my own opinion. Maybe further along the conversation, we can bring, come back to that. So thank you for bringing it up. And um, point of sorry, point of clarification. Uh, sure. So Trustee um, Carabella said that it's mandated. It's not mandated. It's suggested. Correct. Just a clarification. Uh, so, and if nobody else has a, I'd like to. I put myself in order, unless there's somebody else who would like to. Um, I just think. With our children, they start the day with O Canada, which is recognizing the great country that we live in, and then opening prayer. Why are we overshadowing those two amazing things with the oath of citizenship, right? The last thing that they should have before they start their school day is our opening prayer, and that's right after O Canada. So why are we muddying that water? That's the way I see it, and that's my opinion on it. There's nothing wrong with having the oath if you, we could have it put in a little frame in the school so that it's a reminder, but to have our children have to say it every day, I think it it takes away from what we are, which is a Catholic school board, and that what we're there and we're there to gather together as one family under God and to start our day, and that's why we do prayer. And that's our last, that should be the last thing that we leave with our children before they start their day. Through you, Madam Chair, to um, Superintendent Ballog. On on a daily basis, what are the so how does the uh, exercises go? And is would there be place for the Our Father, or is is it like a different prayer that's said every day? What is that opening prayer? Through you, Madam Chair, I, I would say it varies to some degree. We do have students who are involved in prayer um, and faith formation every morning. So we typically would start with O Canada, followed by the Oath of Citizenship, um, and then move into prayer or vice versa. There's not a specific order that's been stipulated. The prayer often has a, a gospel, liturgical reading. Depending on the age of the child, it's modified so that they can participate in sharing the word. Um, some schools will do the Hail Mary every day, some will do the Our Father every day, some will do it in different languages so we can be inclusive of everyone in our building and that often happens as well. Some will do it in French. I, I think that all of our schools do a really great job right now, in my personal opinion, of 
making those decisions for their school communities uh, about how they want to gather their student population in prayer, really dependent on what's happening in the building at that time. Sorry, and through you, Superintendent, and just in my experience and what I've seen when I've been at a couple of different schools for morning, it really is guided by what the gospel is for that week, and then they adapt it. So for us to all of a sudden say and dictate what prayer they should be saying, I think we're taking it away from what we want our students to do, which is, is to be part of it and to partake in it and be part of that decision-making process. Right? So I think what Trustee Zernata said is she's going to defer back to um, Trustee Agnew and let us know if she would like it to come back as, a, as an action item. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to item 5.2, uh, PPM 162. This is a discussion item on exemption from instruction related to the human development and sexual health expectations in the Ontario curriculum. Health and Physical Education, Grades 1 to 8, 2019, Superintendent Percasso. Through you, Madam Chair, just uh, to uh, continue from what uh, you've opened with with regard to the exemption, uh, we're looking at a memorandum, uh, the memorandum PPM 162, that asks us to develop and implement a policy or procedure that allows students to be exempted from the strand specific to instruction related to the human development and sexual health expectations. So through the commentary, we've listed some resources for you and have indicated that we've had this process in place um, informally um, since 2016 or the publication of the 2015 curriculum and the protocols for elementary administrators in response to parent requests for student withdrawal from the fully alive uh, created sexual male and female unit are in place. So the discussion and the um, exemption memorandum asks us to look at developing or asks you, the Board of Trustees, to decide whether we're developing a procedure or a policy, but to let you know that we already have uh, something in keeping that could be uh, very easily formalized. So at this time, I certainly welcome uh, your questions and I'm pleased to provide any clarifications with regard to any of the attachments or items that we have provided for you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Trustees or not? Um, Albeit that we've already had all this, the education in our Fully Alive program in the past from grades one to eight, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you happen to know how many parents have pulled their children out of these particular sessions over the past little while? Through you, Madam Chair. Actually, we also did this out of interest when we first um, went through this process in 2016 and just recently updated it. Um, originally in 2016, we had eight schools and a total of 24 students that were withdrawn. And as of this week, we have nine schools and 16 students withdrawn. And these are official requests, letters from parents, specific grades, um, and the students are withdrawn. Usually, as I said, our family life programs are delivered on a Friday, so it's the same time of the week, and so the school accommodates those students that are withdrawn. Again, very small numbers, one or two at most um, at these few schools. Trustee O'Brien. Uh, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, it says in the um, purpose, um, that we must develop and implement a policy or procedure. Can we do both? The reason I ask is because I, I feel that we have to develop a policy, otherwise we're giving up our, our role in governance, but yet a policy without a procedure takes away the operational um, aspect of the policy. I, I Superintendent Ballard. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we did add it to the agenda tonight as a discussion item for that purpose because when we reviewed the PPM in the first sentence, it says um, that each board must implement a policy or procedure and then throughout the document it's policy slash procedure. So we wanted to add it as a discussion item this evening to determine if we are in fact going to move forward with our policy development process and then from that will come an operational procedure that will outline 
basically what we've been doing for a number of years and what our current practice is, taking into consideration all the pieces from the PPM. So we would have two different routes. If we're going to go with the policy, then this is a discussion item. I would propose that, and it does need to be in place by November 30th is the suggested date in the PPM. Um, so if we are moving forward with a the policy, then we could have a draft uh, by October 8th and we could bring it back here as a policy and um, put it before you to determine our next steps. And then at the November 12th uh, meeting, we can move forward with first reading, put it out for stakeholder feedback, and then have it back um, by December 10th. If we are, actually I'm gonna re restate those dates. October 8th, if we bring it back here as an action item with our draft, October 15th, it could go to the board meeting at first reading. Following first reading, it'll go out for stakeholder feedback. That will give us time to have it back in November for our policy meeting, and then it can go to board November 19th for second and third if we're all in agreement, and if we aren't. We've at least gone through first reading, so we can consider it an established policy at that point. And um, otherwise, we would just go procedural. If we have a policy, we definitely would want to develop a procedure to accompany that. Thank you for the minute, Chair. We could decide tonight then. We Pardon me? We could. We would bring it back as an action item on the next meeting. Trustee Carabell? Thank you, through Madam Chair. I'm understanding that we could vote whether it goes to a policy or a procedure tonight. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And then you said that you would come up with a draft. We would be prepared through you, Madam Chair, right. to have a draft right. for our October meeting. Yep. If you're in agreement to have a vote and you support that, mm -hmm. that would be our next step. I, yeah, I would put forward a motion to uh, create a policy. Okay. Discussion? Okay, so the motion is from Trustee Caraballa mm -hmm. that um, that the draft policy be brought back for the October 8th, 9th, uh, 2019 policy meeting um, so that it can go through the process of first reading and go up for stakeholder feedback. So barring no questions, we'll go right to a vote. Trustee O'Brien? In favor. Trustee Antomas? In favor. Trustee Caraballa? In favor. Trustee Murphy? In favor. Trustee DeRoy? In favor. Trustee Duarte? In favor. Trustee O'Hearn Zernata? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. So we're moving on to information items. Um, I can do that. So we've got information item 6.1 Administrative Procedure VI 04 Complaints Resolution Process Workplace Discrimination, Harassment, Violence. Uh, Superintendent uh, Ballo. Through you, Madam Chair, present to you as information items. Um, the first procedure is VI04. It's the corresponding procedure that accompanies the uh, workplace discrimination and harassment policy that we reviewed this evening. The significant change is adding the word discrimination because we've changed the title and the reference throughout the document. And the only other change are the references have been updated to include the legislative pieces. I can continue if you want. And then we go to item 6.2, uh, which is Administrative Procedure VI-28, Selection and Appointment of Positions of Academic Administrative Responsibilities. Again, to you, Superintendent Ballo. Yes, for your information and through you, Madam Chair, we have the procedure which had been approved by and has been approved by senior administration. I understand that we will be deferring this policy to a future meeting. Um, so we will leave this as is and if anything needs to be reviewed at a later time, then that feedback would come back through senior admin to update the procedure. At this time, this is the procedure that was approved. Item 6.3, Administrative Procedure VI-53, Optional French Programming. Superintendent Percassin. Through you, Madam Chair, just a, a quick overview that we've eliminated the word early um, throughout the document as uh, our program now goes to grade seven, so it is the French Immersion Program, no longer early, so that's been overdue, and that's the only change that we're presenting in VI-53. 
uh, for your reference this evening. Thank you. Under item 6.4, these are upcoming agenda items for the next meeting. Um, and then we'll move right on to item 7, right? No, 6.5. Uh, the 2019 to 2020 work plan, Superintendent Fallow. Through you, Madam Chair, the work plan has been provided for your information. It outlines what the plan is at this point for the year. As you can see, it is flexible and fluid because we add and um, eliminate sometimes policies, but typically we're adding or moving uh, policies that are up for review to a following month, and that's why we consider this a flexible document. Thank you. And moving on to item 6.6, .6, I think this is just really for information. Information. It's just it's the policy working group committee mm -hmm. members. Mm -hmm. It is there for your information. It's a working group. I think Secretary Daly has. Uh, no. I think he. Has. I have some things there. You have a question, Superintendent. For you, Trustee Ann Tomasi. For you, Madam Chair. I was just wondering that since you have that working group, if we could include trustees to sit in that group. I think it would give us some advance notice of the policies and how you are putting them together so that they're better understood and then we could take a lead given that we're going through so many policies in a night. I think it would be worthwhile for your consideration. Well, for trustees' consideration. you, Madam Chair. What I can offer is it is a principal working group. It's not my experience. I've got limited experience to have the principals amongst the Board of Trustees to be having those types of conversations. Typically, just so you're aware of what the meeting looks like, um, we talk about very much the operational pieces and what the impact will be at the operational level. We'll have a discussion. They'll share those pieces with me as the superintendent for policy, and then any relevant changes or pertinent changes are communicated with you. So I'm not sure that you know that there's a place for that. As a policy committee, you're all part of the policy committee at this meeting. I through you, Madam Chair. Uh, follow up. So I, I think the way I'm coming at this is that it would give us insight into how a policy goes together, how, it dif how the procedures differentiate from the policy itself, and how it's delivered. Because after all, again, we as trustees are responsible for delivering the policies. Uh, knowing how they go together and being able to be part of that process to see how the stakeholders and what kind of input they have into the policy and the procedures, I think it's a really worthwhile exercise. So, oh, okay, so uh, just just a quick point though, uh, our bylaws are very specific on the policies that we sit on in the committees, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm just, I just, let me finish, I'm just trying to think is, is, is it something, there's mandate or is this an ask, like are you asking if it's possible to attend as, a, as an observer? Well, no, to have a, to have membership on that particular committee, I think it's worthwhile being part of the working committee because we do add value as trustees because we do have information that comes to us directly from parents that may necessarily not come to staff. So what I'm asking is that we create a place and create a bylaw that would allow us to sit on that committee. It's within our purview. Superintendent Cipriano. Through you, Madam Chair, if I can get provide some historical background. Um, uh, when I first got into the role of superintendent, my, my, uh, one of my portfolios was policy and we didn't have a working group at the time. And so with our director of education at the time, uh, Paula Dawson, we decided to create a policy working group of, of principals in our schools to review policies that would affect our schools, our, 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 our frontline staff. Um, at that time, trustees uh, around the table, I think that they were all different trustees, even before you, uh, Trustee Carabella, had asked to observe a meeting. And so we sent out over several months, they do take place during the work day, we sent out our meeting times and dates and we invited uh, trustees to sit in as observers and of course if they had any comments or, or input, it would be accepted. 
At that time, there was there was debate around the table regarding whether uh, trustees should sit in as a, a participant or not. Uh, it was decided at that time that ultimately you do have the ability at this table to affect change to policies, and so you do have that ability. Uh, it's the policy changes that are that are made at policy working group are just recommendations. Uh, it, they are just uh, recommendations for you as a group of trustees to decide whether to accept, whether to deny, whether to amend, whether to uh, completely ignore. And so, again, you uh, through our director of education, I'm not sure if, if possibly there would be an opportunity over this year uh, to have that similar type of invitation uh, to s observe what this looks like. Also during that first year, we also invited our principals to come and sit in at policy meetings uh, when they were, uh, and, and I'm not sure if it still takes place in this format, uh, Superintendent Ballow, but uh, typically a group of principals will take on a specific policy in a more uh, direct way, intimate way, and then bring to the, uh, to the greater group what the recommendations are, and then there's debate and conversation and changes possibly. So those principals in that first year were invited to come and sit in to observe policy, the policy committee, and then at times as well make comments when asked upon how this, how possible amendments would make, uh, what, what effect it could have in a school, secondary or elementary. So just wanted to give that as, as some background information of where this came from, what it, what it looks like, and, it, and what it maybe has evolved into. Sorry, and I apologize, Trustee Blunty. That's okay. Uh, to you, Madam Chair, uh, just a comment. I'm not sure I would like to be part of the discussion with our great principals. They're all fantastic, getting a good job there. Uh, but question to, to Trustee Antamasi, is it, uh, is it the timeline that you are concerned about that you're receiving policies just before the meetings? Or is it, do you want the policy to come to us a little earlier? I would like the policies to come a little earlier, just so that I can skim through them. Sometimes we have four or five policies or more. So is it that, you're, uh, that thing that you're concerned about or you actually physically want to be with our principals discussing and whatever, you know? So what's your real uh, question? So through you, Madam Chair, um, in response to Trustee Duarte, um, my focus would be on how the policies go together, how the stakeholders respond to the inputs to a particular policy, how the, per, the, the procedures are attached to the policy, and how it fits in with our overall governance. Um, it seems to me that that should have been done many years ago. I know that there are boards that do have it. Um, I think it's worthwhile. I think it's enlightening. and. Um, I think it could work out really well because then we can come back to the board and say, you know, we, I sat on that policy and here's the reason why that policy is the way it is and that's the reason why it blends into the Ministry of Labor or whether it be, you know, any other legislation that's governing us here. So thank you, Trustee Antomasi. The only comment I would offer is, is it sounds like we're getting into something that is dictated by our bylaws and our bylaws are up for review this year. If there are issues in regards to timing, not there is absolutely about our committees and what we sit on is in our bylaws. Excuse me. Sorry, I, well, I'm not finished, Trustee Antoasi. <laughs> I, I, but I asked if I could respond and I'm trying to guide the way the conversation is going right now to understand where we're going. So. Superintendent Ballo has presented the committee, so you're asking for us to actually participate in that committee. Our bylaws speak to the committees that we sit on. If there is an additional committee that we want to sit on, we are on, this is a policy committee. That's a policy working group. It's not a committee. So if you want to, my understanding is, and I am not the expert on this, but I would say that that falls under our bylaws and, and how that falls. Please correct me if I'm on the wrong track and if I'm saying something other than so what you're suggesting. For you, Madam Chair, to respond to your question, as trustees, we have the purview to create any committee we want. So we would have to create a motion that would speak to us participating in that particular working group. Trustee DeRosa. 
for you, Madam Chair. The reference to um, the bylaws is quite accurate, and, and uh, we're, there are specific committees that, that are dictated a trustee representation uh, through our bylaws. Uh, but I would offer again at the, at the risk of sounding repetitive because I know I've made this point many times over tonight. This is again um, uh, an initiative that that brings us into uh, the operational realm. And um, you know we have superintendents, we have our director who comes here every at every meeting who would give us the insight and the questions uh, that may come up on the policies being presented at, at, this, uh, at this meeting. So again, what I have to offer here is uh, how deep to really, really, really want to get into the operations. And we need guidance on that. Hopefully we'll come over the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Trustee DeRosa, Trustee O'Brien. Thank you to you, Madam Chair. Um, to Stephanie Beloff, does um, this group come up with those procedures as well? For you, Madam Chair, they don't necessarily develop the procedure. Typically, we haven't had too many procedures that we've had to create from scratch. Our procedures exist. So a typical meeting would be if we have um, four policies that are up for review for an upcoming meeting. Those would be the ones that the group would focus on that month and as Superintendent Sapriano explained, people will sign up for the policies that they may be more interested in participating in and they'll work in partners. So it's not often even happening necessarily at the table. What they'll bring back is the conversation or whatever the suggestions are that they're making or questions. So sometimes it's minor edits, they have found typos, etc. Or it'll just um, expand into a conversation about on an operational level what does this look like in your class or in your school and if there is a procedure yes they would have the opportunity to look at the draft procedure we wouldn't have them create it that's something as superintendents we work with our own departments as um, superintendent Cipriano mentioned with the service animals for example he already has a core committee that worked on developing that policy he'll bring it back to that committee to develop the procedure and then we may put it out to our policy working group to say this is the proposed procedure set of uh, a new set of eyes is there anything that you see any general feedback they don't get into really looking at you know, developing the policies. We work on a framework of that policy and we bring it to them. Another good example was digital citizenship last year because we spent a lot of time on that one and I think that the two or three people that signed up to work on that one met, honestly, like six times. There's, uh, we meet just to sort of decide what's going to need to be done and then to bring back the work and we didn't have a procedure. We only had a policy that was very lengthy, so that group took it upon themselves to work through developing a procedure that again was overseen by a superintendent, consultants, any other uh, specialists that needed to be involved in that. So that their role really is to sort of look at what's been done, offer any feedback to myself as well. So if we're talking about making a change to a policy or procedure, they'd say to me, listen, I don't know if that's going to work, or yes, that's a good idea. Or when we're talking about you know, opening exercises, they may offer you know, what they do in their school. So it's more of a conversation around the operational practices in schools as it is a legislative discussion. Or uh, That happens more at this point. And by the time we get it here, We've had the discussion. I've shared the recommendations or the feedback. Sometimes it's just good feedback for us as superintendents to know how we can support our principals who are working through the policy. And then any pertinent changes are outlined for you for your review. So amendments aren't happened there. There's suggestions and mostly discussion. Any other questions or comments? We'll move to item seven, miscellaneous information. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. ignoring you. Um, and I'm, I'll be corrected procedurally. Um, I was wondering if it would be possible to reconsider the timelines around uh, the French staff report coming back. Uh, Fred's not gonna be, he's on holidays at the next policy meeting and he's doing capital plan right now. Uh, I, I just wondered if it'd be possible if we could 
defer it until the, the meeting following that so we can get it. It's going to be a fair amount of work. So, so are we all in favor? So, so it's to change. It's, we're just revising that original motion to read November 12th as opposed to October 8th. So can we just have a show of hands, everybody in favor? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So item seven, miscellaneous information. There is none. Item eight, in camera. We have no items to move into camera. Item nine, I need a motion to excuse Trustee Agnew, Trustee Antomasi, seconded by Trustee DeRosa, and uh, a motion to adjourn. Trustee Zernota, seconded by Trustee Duarte. And we have our closing prayer, which if Trustee DeRosa, you could please lead us in. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm delighted to do this. Um, our Father, Sons, Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of our time together, we thank you for what has been accomplished here today. May the matters discussed serve as a catalyst to move us forward and cause us to advance and see growth in all areas of our lives. May we leave here recognizing you are the God of all wisdom and you are willing to lead us forward. This we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.